Explicit content is found in this episode. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. A serial killer comes to Wichita Falls, Texas to murder women. A predator who left three women's families devastated and questioning who was the killer in Wichita. Okay, on to the show. Farian Edward Wardrip was born in Salem, Indiana on March 6, 1959. His father, George, was a factory worker and his mother, Diana, was a homemaker. Farian was the fourth born of nine children. He had six sisters and two brothers. Not many details are known about Farian's childhood, but it has been reported that he did not have any unusual emotional or behavioral problems. According to author Patricia Stringer, who wrote Body Hunter, Farian did not have a good relationship with his father. They were always at odds with each other, and at one point, Farian let his friend drive the vehicle that his father had recently purchased for him. The friend ended up blowing out the engine of the vehicle. George was so upset with Farian that he told him he needed to move out of the house. Farian subsequently dropped out of high school before he was able to finish his senior year. He felt like he had nowhere to go, so he joined the National Guard in 1978. After finishing boot camp, Farian was sent back to Indiana, where he was expected to attend one weekend of drill a month, as well as a few weeks in the summer. Irresponsible as ever, Farian rarely attended drill. He was also caught smoking marijuana and presented less than acceptable conduct. Due to his behavior, Farian received a less than honorable discharge. In the early 1980s, George moved with his family to Texas so he could look for new work. Farian moved with them. While living in Wichita Falls, Farian met a young woman named Jonna and the two married in 1983. They had a son Brandon that same year and a daughter Erin in 1985. The marriage was far from perfect. Jonna didn't work because she wanted to be a housewife. Farian worked a lot of different jobs, but only stayed long enough to pay for his ever-growing drug habit. When he did drugs, Farian's anger intensified and he became physically abusive. In an effort to make a steady income, Farian took a job as a janitor at Wichita General Hospital in Wichita Falls. He was later promoted to orderly. Oftentimes, Jonna's parents helped the young couple with money, but they could only take so much before they finally cut them off. They told Jonna she and the kids could move in with them, but Farian was not welcome. After moving in with her parents, Jonna filed for divorce. Farian thought he was better off alone and made no attempt to save his marriage. He continued supporting his drug habit and did as he wished. This included more nefarious things that would often be triggered by his anger. The first person exposed to his deadly intentions was Terry Lee Sims. Terry Lee Sims was born on May 14, 1964, in Wichita Falls, Texas, to parents Kit and Marcia. She was a technical assistant at Bethania Regional Healthcare Center and a student at Midwestern State University. On December 20th, 1984, at around 11 o'clock p.m., Terry finished a shift at the hospital. Terry and her friend Lisa headed back to Lisa's house where Lisa was going to help Terry study for an upcoming exam. Shortly after arriving, Lisa received a phone call asking her to come back to the hospital because they were short-staffed. Lisa left Terry with her house keys and headed back to the hospital. On the same evening, Farian got into an argument with Jonna, so he left the house to go for a walk and clear his head. As he was finishing up his walk, he noticed Terry Sims on a nearby porch. As she headed back inside the front door, Farian came up behind her and forced himself inside the house. He proceeded to sling her all over the house in a violent rage. Terry fought back, but she was unable to subdue her attacker. Farian tied Terry's hands behind her back with an electrical cord stripped her naked, and raped her. He then stabbed her eight times in the chest, three times in the back, and once in her left arm. 
Farian left the house and went home. Lisa arrived back home around 7 o'clock a.m. She knocked on the door, but there was no answer, so she asked her landlord to let her in. When Lisa entered the house, she immediately noticed that there had been a struggle inside. Lisa and her landlord searched the house and found Terry lying naked in her own blood on the bathroom floor. When Wichita Falls City Police arrived at the scene, they took DNA samples for further testing. It was later discovered that there was not enough DNA collected to be tested. Police initially suspected Terry's ex-boyfriend was the murderer, but he was found to be innocent. With no DNA or suspect, the case fell cold. The murder gave him a high he had never experienced before with any of the drugs he had taken. It was a high he would continue to chase, but his drug of choice was now murder. This quest to find his next victim would lead him to a co-worker at Wichita General Hospital. Tony Jean Gibbs was born on February 14, 1961, in Clayton, New Mexico, to parents Walden and Donnie. Tony graduated from Midwestern State University and went on to work as a nurse at Wichita General Hospital, the same hospital Farian Wardrip was an orderly at. In the early morning of January 19, 1985, 23-year-old Tony was driving away from work when she saw Farian out walking and offered him a ride. Farian had gotten into another argument with his wife and was out clearing his head on a walk. Farian got into Tony's car and aggressively told her to drive. He grabbed Tony, and she swerved off the road and came to a stop. When Tony started driving again, Farian told her to turn down a nearby dirt road that led to a field. Farian screamed at her to stop the car. As the car came to a stop, Tony jumped out and made a run for it, but Farian was able to catch up with and overpower Tony. Farian then stripped off Tony's clothes raped and stabbed her three times in the back and three times in the chest. Farian left the field and drove off in Tony's car. He later abandoned the car on the side of the freeway. The next day, Tony's brother reported her missing to the police, and two days later, Tony's vehicle was found. The abandoned car was the police's only clue, and it led nowhere. On February 15, 1985, an electrician went to check on a transformer when he saw Tony Gibbs's nude body laying in a field. Her body was found right over the Archer County line. When Archer County police arrived at the scene, they found blood and Tony's clothes inside an abandoned bus near where her body was found. DNA swabs were taken from the scene. Police determined that Tony was most likely declothed and tortured inside the bus and later crawled into the field where she succumbed to her injuries. As Tony Gibbs's murder was investigated, detectives honed in on one man, Danny Laughlin. Danny was a barback at the Stardust, a club Tony frequented. Danny became a suspect when he was being interrogated for a theft. As an alibi, Danny told police he did not commit the theft because at the time of the theft, he was riding his bike in a field outside of town, the same field Tony's body was found in. When police felt they had enough evidence to charge Danny with the murder of Tony, he was brought in to give blood and hair samples and to take a polygraph. The DNA sample results were inconclusive, and Danny failed three polygraphs. While in jail, Danny reportedly told a jailmate, Harry Harrison, that he was the one who killed Tony. Danny also told Harry details about the case that only the murderer would know. The prosecution's case against Danny was growing stronger. After spending six months in jail awaiting trial, Danny's trial finally began. Danny testified that he lied about being in the field, and he was actually the one conducting the theft. He knew that admitting to the burglary was better than going to a prison for a murder he did not commit. While on the stand, Danny admitted to reading Tony's case file while he was left alone in the captain's office during questioning. That's how he knew so many murder details. Danny also told the jury where he was at the time Tony disappeared. He and a friend were moving into his new apartment. After hearing Danny's alibi and reason for knowing the details of Tony's murder, 
the jury was unable to reach a verdict. All but one of the jurors found Danny to be innocent, so the judge called for a mistrial. However, the case was not closed. The prosecutor continued building the case against Danny, so he could be charged again at a later date. Less than a week after murdering Tony Gibbs, Varian Wardrip quit his job at Wichita General Hospital and moved two hours away to Fort Worth to find a new job. Varian rented a room at a travel lodge, and while staying there, he started using drugs again. In the haze of it all, Varian couldn't stop what he was doing. He had urges that led him to murder. He went out on a night on the town to find his next victim. The need to kidnap, rape, and murder was overwhelming. He opted to head to a local nightclub. There, he would meet a young mother of two who wanted to enjoy a night out on the town. Instead, she would come face to face with the serial killer whose insatiable urges would take her away from her family. Deborah Sue Huey Taylor was born on April 5, 1959, in Tarrant County, Texas. During her first marriage, Deborah had a daughter, Tara, in 1977. She later remarried to a man named Richard Ken Taylor and had a second daughter, Jennifer, in 1980. Deborah was a homemaker. She was thankful that her husband could support her dream of being an active and attentive parent to their children. On the night of March 24, 1985, 26-year-old Deborah asked her husband Ken if he wanted to go dancing at the nearby nightclub, but Ken said he was too tired. Deborah then left the house and walked to the nightclub alone. While at the nightclub, Deborah started dancing with a man named Farian. After a few dances, Deborah decided it was time to head home and headed to the parking lot. Farian followed and offered to give her a ride home in his car, a car that was actually not his but stolen from the travel lodge parking lot. Before getting in the car, Farian made a sexual advance towards Deborah, but Deborah said no and slapped him. Farian, not keen on being rejected, lost control of his emotions, and strangled Deborah. Farian then put Deborah's body in the car, drove to a remote location, and threw her body out. When Deborah did not return home the next morning, Ken reported her missing. On March 29th, construction workers found Deborah's body in a grove of trees. She had suffered blunt force injuries to her head and face, but police could not determine if she had been raped. Police suspected Deborah's husband, Ken, was the murderer. The Taylor residence was searched multiple times, and Ken was interrogated several times. He even took, and passed, more than one polygraph. Although no charges were ever filed against Ken, police never took their suspicion off him. The assumptions ruined Ken's life. He lost custody of his children, and Deborah's family excommunicated him. After murdering Deborah and failing to find employment, Farian moved back to Wichita Falls. He found some comfort in returning to familiar surroundings. It was familiar territory that made his hunting much easier. Unfortunately, he would strike a little too close to home. Ellen Blau was born on March 18, 1964, in Connecticut, to parents Murray and Rima. At around age 18, Ellen met and married a man named Jeff and moved to Texas with him. While living in Wichita Falls, Ellen worked at a restaurant called Subs and Suds. On September 20th, 1985, 21-year-old Ellen left Subs and Suds to meet up with some friends. After she was done hanging out with her friends, Ellen stopped by a convenience store. Just as she pulled into the convenience store parking lot, Farian, who was out walking, noticed Ellen. I'm going to pause the case right here so you can hear a word from our sponsor. He approached Ellen as she was getting out of the car and asked what she was doing. Farian then grabbed Ellen, slammed her against the side of the car, and pushed her inside. He forced Ellen to drive around the outskirts of town until they found a dirt road. Once the two were stopped on the dirt road, Farian drug Ellen out of the car and took her into a nearby field. While in the field, Farian stripped and murdered Ellen. Farian then headed back to town in Ellen's car 
and parked it in the nearby apartment complex he lived in. The next day, when she did not return home, Ellen's roommate reported her missing. Ellen lived with her friend Janie and Janie's husband Danny in the same apartment building as Farian. On October 10, 1985, a county employee was mowing a rural road just outside Wichita Falls city limits when he saw Ellen's body in the overgrowth. Ellen's body was too decomposed to take any DNA samples, and it was impossible to tell if she had been sexually assaulted. Due to the level of decomposition, Ellen's cause of death was ruled as undetermined homicidal violence. Although the body was too decomposed to identify, police believe that the body fit the description of Ellen, who had been reported missing the month prior. Wichita County Police set their suspicions on the two men who were last seen with Ellen. The two men passed polygraphs. There was insufficient evidence to charge them, so the case was kept open. Farian found employment at the Stardust nightclub as a bouncer. He had no idea why he murdered, but the urge to do so was so overwhelming. He couldn't help that he snapped and flew into a murderous rage. He was fiending for another fix when he decided to visit a friend of his, Tina Kimbrew. He knew Tina from her waitressing job and thought she would be able to help him score. Tina Elizabeth Kimbrew was born on October 27, 1964, in Houston, Texas, to parents Robert and Nelma. While living in Wichita Falls, Tina worked as a bartender and waitress at a hotel. Tina met and befriended Farian Wardrip while working at the hotel. On May 6, 1986, 21-year-old Tina was inside her apartment when Farian knocked on her door. Tina let him inside, and Farian grabbed Tina and began attacking her. He suffocated Tina to death with a pillow, left her apartment, and fled to Galveston, Texas. A few hours after the murder, Tina's grandmother and cousin stopped by Tina's apartment to check on her. Tina hadn't shown up to her mother's scheduled surgery, so they were worried about her. Upon entering her apartment, Tina's grandmother and cousin saw her dead body and called police. Three days after murdering Tina, Farian called the Galveston Police Department and told them he had a murder to confess to. The police picked Farian up at his hotel and took him to the station where he confessed to killing Tina. Farian told police that he had initially showed up at Tina's apartment to buy drugs from her. None of our research definitively identified Tina as a drug dealer, so this may have just been Farian's way of making Tina seem like less of a victim. He claimed that once inside the apartment, Farian saw his ex-wife Jonna's face and not Tina's, causing him to snap. On December 2, 1986, Farian pled guilty to murder and was sentenced to 35 years in prison. While in prison for Tina Kimbrew's murder, Farian became a born-again Christian. He was also a model prisoner. He had only a few infractions, including creating a disturbance and fighting without a weapon. In December of 1997, after serving only 11 years, Farian was let out on parole. He moved to Olney, Texas to live with his parents. Everyone in the small town knew that Farian had just been released from prison, but they did not know why he had been jailed. Farian told everybody that he had been imprisoned for vehicular homicide from an unavoidable accident. He also wore an ankle monitor, so his parole officer was always aware of his location. While living in Olney, Farian got a job at a door and screen shop and became active in the church. He sang in the choir and taught Sunday school. Farian also started dating a woman he met through a church friend. Her name was Glenda. The couple started out long-distance dating while Glenda finished Bible college in Lubbock, Texas. They were soon engaged. In October 1998, Glenda moved into an apartment in the same complex Farian's parents lived in. Glenda and Farian moved in together after they were married on October 15, 1998. Meanwhile, the police were still investigating the unsolved murders of Farian's other victims. After advancements in DNA testing technology, DNA that was taken from Tony Gibbs's body was retested. The test results showed that Danny Laughlin was not the rapist or the murderer, but it was too late for Danny's name to be cleared. He had died in a car crash in 1993. 
Wichita County District Attorney Barry Maka started looking back into the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau. While looking through the files, Maka noticed that all three of the cases were similar, so he asked for their DNA samples to be tested against each other. The test results showed that DNA taken from both Terry and Tony were from the same person. There was not sufficient DNA evidence taken from Ellen's body in order to test. The two once unrelated cases were now linked. Over the next few years, DNA samples from potential suspects were tested, but no matches were found. In early January of 1999, Maka asked his investigator, John Little, to review the case files for the three unsolved murders. As Little read each case file, he noticed a few things about a man named Farian Wardrip that stood out to him. In the 1986 investigation into Ellen Blau's murder, Farian told police he knew Ellen, but that statement was never followed up on. Little also read that Ellen's roommates, Janie and Danny Ball, told police about their creepy neighbor, Farian Wardrip. The Balls told police that they had warned Ellen to stay away from him. After seeing his name come up in the Ellen Blau case, Little started looking more into Farian. While investigating, Little found that Farian had lived less than two blocks away from where Terry Sims was murdered, and also had worked at the same hospital Tony worked at. Little learned that Farian had recently been paroled after serving 11 years of a 35-year murder sentence. With all of this new information, Little knew he had to test Farian's DNA against the DNA found on Terry and Tony. However, Farian's DNA was not in the DNA database because the blood samples taken after his 1986 arrest had been destroyed after his sentencing. Little took this information to Maka, and Maka agreed they had to get Farian's DNA. Because there was not enough probable cause to require Farian to provide a DNA sample, Maka decided that the best way to acquire his DNA was through the Abandoned Interest Law. Basically, Little would have to follow Farian around until he discarded something with his saliva on it, such as a cup or a cigarette butt. Little followed Farian around for days with no success. On the sixth day, Farian was standing outside of his job, drinking coffee and eating crackers. Farian finished his coffee and threw the cup in the trash. Little put some chewing tobacco in his mouth, walked up to Farian, and asked if he could get a spit cup. Farian pointed at the trash and said, Help yourself. Little grabbed the coffee cup that had a cracker bits around the rim and left hurriedly to send the cup off for testing. A few days later, the DNA test results came in. Farian Wardrip was a 1 in 3.23 quadrillion match to the DNA found on Terry and Tony's bodies. The police finally had enough for an arrest warrant. On February 13, 1999, Farian was called to his parole officer's office under the guise of getting his ankle monitor removed. When Farian entered the office, John Little was waiting for him. Little took Farian down to the district attorney's office where the Archer County District Attorney's investigator was waiting to talk to Farian about Ellen Blau's case. The two investigators tried their hardest to get Farian to admit that he had killed all three women, but he would not cooperate. After asking if he could leave, the investigators told Farian that he would not be leaving. In fact, he would be going to jail. Upon arriving at the police station, more DNA samples were taken from Farian, so police could be 100% sure they had the right man. Upon arriving at the police station, more DNA samples were taken from Farian, so police could be 100% sure they had the right man. DNA test results showed that they did. On February 16th, Farian's wife Glinda visited Farian in jail. After Glinda left, Farian told John Little he was ready to confess. He needed to get right with God. During his confession, Farian told John Little that at the time of Terry Sims' murder, he was heavily involved in drugs. His life was a dysfunctional nightmare because he was constantly fighting with his wife, Jonna. Farian told police that every time he killed a woman, he did not see their face. He saw Jonna's. He could never remember how he killed them or if he raped them. 
he just blacked out. After confessing to the murders of Sims, Gibbs, and Blau, John Little got up to leave when Varian said he had one more murder to confess to, that of Deborah Taylor. The trial for Terry Sims' murder began in November of 1999. Although his court-appointed attorney urged him not to, Farian pled guilty to murder. After five days of testimony, the jury decided that Farian should receive the death penalty for murdering Terry. He was sentenced to lethal injection on November 5, 1999. Farian pled guilty to the murders of Gibbs, Taylor, and Blau in exchange for a life sentence for each murder. The life sentences were to run consecutively, and even if Varian ended up not getting executed, he would spend a minimum of 60 years in prison before he was eligible for parole. Some observations on Varian from a more psychological standpoint and what led him to murder so viciously and randomly. He wasn't forced to be responsible by his mother as a child or a teen he was able to get out of responsibility with the military when he was discharged. Jana was the first person to require him to be responsible. He had to work in order to provide for her and their children. He resented her and the kids for that since all he wanted to do was drugs. Similarly, and possibly the most regrettable issue in this case, is that it could have been solved sooner if the three different police departments spoke with each other and shared their findings. As of April 2018, Varian is on death row at the Polanski Unit in Livingston, Texas. He is now married to a woman named Sandra and continues to appeal his death sentence. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive review on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It really does help us out. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFC Pod, Facebook.com forward slash TCFC Podcast. You can also find us on Instagram, TCFC underscore podcast. And of course, our website is truecrimefanclub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. Music for the show was provided by We Talk of Dreams, who created custom music just for us. Check them out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com. Research assistance, content editing, and writing assistance for the show was provided by Brittany Martinez. Audio engineering was provided by Ches Gray, who manages Ches Gray Music. Content warning at the top of the show was provided by Tyler Allen, host of the Minds of Madness podcast. We would like to welcome to the club our most recent Patreon supporter, Robin Warder, from the Trail Went Cold podcast.